Hello and welcome to the Build a Soil 10 by 10. This is season two, episode three, and this is reamending. We're gonna be displaying a video for you today, and that is from the soil doctor Bryant himself with his actual uh, interpretation and all of the prescription for the soil. I wanna discuss it with you. If you follow Build a Soil for a while, you'll know that we wrote our own prescriptions. We actually offered it as a service and we still do that. However, I don't have the time to do everybody's soil prescription. If you wanted to learn on your own, Grab the original, the Steve Solomon, the Intelligent Gardener and learn about it. The original, original, this is the Ideal Soil version 2.0. Um, I bought the 1.0 and then he updated with the 2.0 and there's definitely some great information out here. We use this a lot because it talks about calcareous soils, which we have here in Western Colorado. It discusses all of the math that you would do, everything you can think of about soil testing and amending. And a lot of what we do is unique because we're amending potting soil. And soil Bryant, the soil doctor, has a lot of experience You'll notice on the report it even says he works with build a soil because we'll send it through build a soil to him and he'll give you the interpretation but amending potting soil can be different there's some nuances there it's not the same as the soil that's in the earth and although the organic matter is high that causes some differences from normal soil testing also the size of the scoop they use to measure there's a lot of nuances in there and there's a lot of agreement and disagreement within the soil testing community so what i'm going to share with you today is a little bit about my process and I'm, I'm going to follow the soil doctor Bryant's prescription here almost to the T. But what I want to do is teach you how if you get your own soil prescription, how you might interchange ingredients if you don't have some without having to ask the person who gave you the recommendation and how you would do that with these books. I'm going to share with you the differences that I'm going to be doing and then I also want to explain today how if you don't want to do soil testing, how you can just follow the build a soil way and explain with data from our soil test how, if I would have just gone into the build a soil way, how it would have worked perfect in this scenario. I'm gonna explain the differences between what we've put together for our reamend based on the soil test, what would have happened had I not done that, and just guessed using build a soil products down below on this cart. So I'll, I'll point out the differences between what I'm doing. And then we're actually gonna take all the amendments, the micronutrients, I'm gonna mix the micronutrients in water. We're gonna go into the 10 by 10 tent, right to the three by three bed, I'm gonna reamend it. I'm gonna do it in front of you and show you exactly what it takes to get the job done. Okay, so I mentioned the soil prescription. Let's just jump in and I'm gonna go over it. I've got the video, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. You might not be able to see it on camera, but I'm just gonna talk about it. So you're gonna get a report like this from the soil doctor. This is the general notes on the take and bake number two. It's not a number two recipe, it's just the second cycle. And I indicated that on the soil test. And then right up front, it says your total available nutrient level is moderate. The goal should be to increase levels slowly while focusing on balance. And of course, that's what we wanna do. Your pH is very close to the target pH. Estimated soil solution EC is 1.42. Mid feeding recommendation. So here's the way you get the report. If I had just taken the soil test and I was mid season, my plants are already growing in it. The recommendation for applications would be slightly different than at a reamend. Because at a reamend, I have no plants growing. I can apply a little bit more loosely everything that I want to the soil. You can mix it in, you can lightly till the top inch or so, and you don't have to worry about the plants. Where if you're putting micronutrients in and all these things and the plants are growing, you don't wanna overdo it right in the root zone and you have to have some special considerations. So for the first one, feed liquid nitrogen. We recommend amino acids and what's a, it's what I usually use. In fact, I'll probably grab that bag. I've got two of them. I've got a fish amino acid. It's actually freeze dried fish. It's one of the, it's a primo fish hydrolysate. And we've got the build a soil aminos, which is a non GMO organic soy amino. Those are the two types that you'll most often see. Amino acids are like a protein shake. They're very available nitrogen. And it's a lot less work on the plant to get it this way than it is to work for its own in the soil, especially if you're gonna have to front load a ton of nitrogen, many different genetics act differently. He even mentions that on here that having something like this on hand to spoon feed your nitrogen organically, instead of having to front load it and maybe be a little bit excessive is a better way to go. I'll explain what we're gonna do today, but that would be if you were mid season growing, you wouldn't wanna maybe do it the exact same way. With organics, everything's pretty forgiving. The only thing that we're gonna do today and discuss, which we normally don't do, is these little bits of sulfates here, like copper sulfate, manganese sulfate, zinc sulfate. Typically what we would use is a pre-mixed product, but really those are already in it and they're approved for organic use when you have a soil test that proves that you do need those micronutrients and that's how the whole process is typically run. Down here, I've got big six. You'll notice we talk about big six and the build a soil way is usually to add the big six, which is six micronutrients in humic acid. 
The seventh one that's missing, that's in the TM7 from Faust Bioag, the Cyto Plus, and many others, is iron. In the build a soil way, we usually add copious amounts of rock dust. It's also in the craft blend, and that's where we get our iron from. It's not the exact way, but that's the natural way to do things. So this time we actually have iron sulfate, ferrous sulfate. And it's enough where I'm gonna be mixing this in with the granules instead of watering them in, and I'll explain that. So before I get too far, let me just keep going down the line. Tips, multiple small applications for mid-season is preferable to one large application. The reason why we don't really talk about water only, as many of the other brands do, is first of all, there's plant size to container size. If you grow a 10-foot plant in a one-gallon container, it's no longer water only. I don't wanna mislead people. The other thing is that because many different plants, longer flowering, um, so, you know, narrow leaf, might like a lot less nitrogen than a squatter indoor grown one. And so if we preload the 3.0 or the light soil with a 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen, we could be way overdoing it for a lot of our customers. So we actually recommend in most of our soils, the light and the 3.0, to supplement with some amino acids. You'll be fine right out the gate. None of our soils have a ton of nitrogen. We don't use blood meal or anything like that, no chicken manure. So you're very safe in our product to add some liquid fish or add an amino acid. When tissue test recommendations don't align with the soil tests, default to the tissue recommendation. And so what that means is you can actually test the leaf of the plant that you're growing during the season. And if it looks like it needs something, but your soil test says it's there, you wanna to default to the tissue because that means something's locked up. The tissue is the real world answer where the soil might look right, but there's a complex series of events that happen to get what's in the soil into the plant. So these tips are great for organic farming, whether they're in potting soil or native soil. Learning these skills can help you understand your crop better. And if you did this a couple of times, you might be able to just do this on your own going forward. So let's go on to the re-amendment recommendations. It prints out like this. Down here, there's a whole list of materials. Now on here, there's bone meal, which we're gonna use fish bone meal. They've also got alfalfa meal and soybean meal for our nitrogen sources. It's got soft rock phosphate for the phosphorus and the bone meal for the phosphorus. And then you can see we have gypsum in here, which is calcium sulfate. We really like gypsum. We add it in our craft blend. And then there's a few micronutrients we were low on. Iron, boron, manganese, and zinc, and copper. Um, potassium sulfate was added in here. Typically, we have other ways of doing it, but I'm going to follow the prescription. And so what I've done, just so you know, is I've got all these open. I've already weighed them out. There, you can weigh or measure, right? He gives you a weight per yard or the number of cups or teaspoons per yard. You can follow the weighing it, which is more precise, or you can follow the volume. And we're doing about 70 gallons, maybe a little less, about one third of a yard. So my, I'm gonna take his recommendations, divide them by three to get the amount that I should apply to the take and bake in the three by three, because there's only about 70 gallons of soil in there. So that's what I did. The first one, bone meal, that's in here. That's this layer right here. It's fish bone meal. That's high in calcium and phosphorus. And I put in 3.33 cups. He was calling for 10 cups. I took a third of it because we have a third of the soil volume. That's in here. Next, alfalfa meal. What I did is a little unique. Instead of the alfalfa meal and the soybean meal, I know he's adding those for nitrogen purposes. And the soybean meal is a seed meal. The alfalfa is a green material. I have green material in there growing, the cover crop. I'm gonna be breaking that back down into the soil. So what I did is I grabbed gnarly barley, which is a seed meal. It's better than soy meal in my opinion. A little more expensive, but we're doing a small amount of soil. This is sprouted seeds. It's lentils, it's organic corn, it's organic barley, all pre-sprouted, which adds enzymes. And then in here, you can see what it looks like. All these seeds, instead of just top dressing them like that, I wanted to make my own meal, like soy meal. All meal is, is a certain grind. Flour is a little finer, meal is a little chunkier, cake is a little bit chunkier than that. And so what I did is I blended it all up, those seeds in a bullet blender, and I try and go as short as possible. Once it's blended, I stop because I don't want to heat it up. Another tip would be to keep your seeds in the freezer. You can keep that gnarly barley in the freezer. It'll preserve the enzymes for longer. And then when you blend it, any of the heat from the friction won't overheat it. So that's one tip. I've already got one cup in here, or this is two cups. I've already got two in there. I'm adding the next two. Overdid it a little, but it's okay. So this is my full reamend as far as the organics, so to speak. Quite a bit of stuff, but really when you look at it, it's a couple cups of this, a couple cups of that. It's really not much stuff for that volume of soil. Last, I have the iron sulfate. We always add rock dust for iron. So had I not done this, I'm thinking you can already start to see the pattern. Craft Blend has soft rock phosphate, which is in here. Sorry, I didn't mention that. The fishbone meal, it's in here. 
that was all on the chart. That's in our craft blend. Also in our craft blend, a lot of rock dust that would have the iron and a lot of micronutrients. And then also, uh, I add the seed meal in the craft blend. We have soybean meal in there, we have the malted barley, we have alfalfa meal in there. So that's why craft blend is our go-to. It typically covers the reamend because it would cover small amounts of nitrogen, not to be overdone. It would cover a good, generous helping of phosphorus and calcium, which is clearly what we're amending here. And it has the iron and a lot of the micronutrients in the rock dust, albeit not as precise as the way this is doing it. And so the other thought with the build a soil way is that we would also be supplementing a little bit of nitrogen. And, and here's where the potassium comes from. He mentioned potassium sulfate. He mentioned maybe adding more of the potassium sulfate as we get later into flour to help the flowers stack instead of all up front. Well, you know what we like to add? build a bloom And we also like to add coconut water. Let me show you how that works. So build a bloom this is the phosphorus and the calcium that we're kind of adding that I would be spoon feeding, so to speak, in flour. So I don't overdo the soil, keep it kind of even keeled. And without a soil test, you don't want to overdo it. So that's our way. Craft blend on top, spoon feed this when you get into flour. Now in flour, what's another popular product our customers like to use? The coconut water, especially in flour. And that's because it's a very special organic potassium source, high potassium, lots of sugars. And so instead of adding potassium sulfate, you can add the coconut water. And there's many different ways to get potassium. And on large scale, potassium sulfate, super affordable. I don't have a problem with the product at all. But if you're trying to be above and beyond organic, not use any of these weird micronutrients. The next thing that you'd use besides natural sources of the NPK would be micronutrients. And so in Jadam Farming, they mention using seawater. This is a broken bag, that's why I'm gonna use it. I'd rather take the broken stuff instead of the good ones. This is C90. This is basically ocean water dehydrated. And so instead of putting this in the soil, a lot of organic farmers will actually dilute this in water and foliar spray their plants with a small amount, getting all of the micronutrients from the ocean in the balance that nature has it and delivering it to the plants. And that way you're keeping the buffet full and you don't have to be precision about zinc, copper, manganese, and those things. I think it's probably more advantageous to be very precision with it, but we're also dealing with potting soil and weird stuff that you have to buy and mix in water. We're trying to be organic as possible. So big six is one way to get these, but if you think you're not using these, you're kind of lying to yourself. And if you really don't want to use any of those sulfates, you can use a seawater, you can use rock dust. You might have to foliar spray a few times to make sure the plant's getting what it needs. And if you put seawater right in the soil, it can cause a sodium issue. And so we don't want to water this stuff right in. I hope that makes sense. Instead of me talking all day, I just wanted to highlight how the soil test that we got, the prescription that we got, pretty damn similar to if I did not do this, did some craft blend, spoon fed aminos, and when I went, and, and aloe's got aminos too. And when I transitioned to flour, I switched over and did the build a bloom and did the coconut water. That would basically fit this prescription to a T and it would still follow the build a soil way. Now, instead of following the build a soil way, when you've got science, when you've got the soil test, you can follow your way, which means that you know what your soil has specifically. But when you're in the driver's seat, you can pick and choose every ingredient you use. And you can also work with Bryant to say, hey, I don't like this ingredient. Can you change it out and put a different one in? And if you have the book, you don't even need to call him. You could just say, hey, soybean meal is normally at this percentage of nitrogen. My exchange product is at this percentage. How many more cups or less cups do I require? And all the math is in here. If you're uncomfortable, you can just ask. And there's plenty of people out there to help, including us, including Bryant. Uh, his website we'll put in this video somewhere so you can find it. His social media make it easier to connect with him. But what you'll find, if I were to show you our test, we'll put it up on the screen. It's low in sodium, it's low in bicarbonate, it's low in chlorides. And so when you get balance in that regard where you're low in the problems, it's very easy to add the positives back. And that's why build a soil is very easy to work with. Bryant will mention it in the video, which I'll play for you in a second. But at the end of the day, if you have excesses, this might be a little bit weirder. So if you're using some random recipe, not build a soil, it might be fully advantageous to get a soil test. If you're using the take and bake, you might just be able to follow the build a soil way. And that's why we built it that way. But if you're like me, you like science, Certainly, you can send it off to Bryant, you can send it off to Logan Labs, and there's many ways to dial this in. Let's get to it. I'm gonna dump this in here. This is the iron sulfate. And what I'll do is I'll kind of shake this all up and mix that together so when I apply it to the soil, it's all evenly applied. And then what I've also gotta do is mix the micronutrients in. So I've got about a gallon of water in here. The goal is to use enough water where I can evenly cover the whole bed. That way, I evenly apply the micronutrients because I've got right here some zinc do you think I could evenly sprinkle that on the whole bed? Probably not, it's gonna be a hot spot somewhere. So I'm gonna mix this in water. Before I add the water, 
add it to the water, I'm actually gonna add some of the J Plant speaker, the Q, the Q Yaha. Main reason is this will add that foaminess to my water that'll make sure that these stay in suspension and stay mixed in there. So I'm gonna do that right now. About an eighth of a teaspoon is all that I need, so I'm barely gonna put some in. And I'm just gonna go ahead and dump these in here. I'm not wearing gloves. I've already measured this out. It is sulfates, so if that's a concern for you, you might wanna consider wearing some gloves. I'm just gonna wash my hands afterwards. Make sure I get all of that in there. Copper looks a little weird. Copper sulfates, blue. Those are the crystals. Just gonna go ahead and dump that in there. That's copper. Of course, this is approved for organic production. It shows that we have a, a shortage of copper in there. So there's many ways to do it. There's liquid micronutrients. Oh, not gonna pour. So that stuff had a little bit of moisture there. I'm just gonna slip that in there and make sure I get all of it in the water. Okay, it's all in there now. That's it. I'm gonna go ahead and put this on and shake it. And then I gotta evenly apply this across the soil, which I'll probably do last. That way I can work in all those amendments and get them all wet and get them all covered in micronutrients. Besides this report, which it's kind of hard to show, I wanna show you the video because you're also gonna get a video if you work with Bryant. And let me pull it up because he said some great things about our soil and I wanna cover it for you. So here's our soil test and he's gonna be explaining it. Hey Jeremy, I'm gonna show you what I'm seeing on these soil tests and just walk you through uh, the recommendation. So I'm writing some mid-season feeding recommendations because if the plants are already in the ground, I would want to uh, apply these sort of as a, a liquid feed. Um, if not, these are the, the pre-plant recommendations to um, amend this soil to reach both sufficiency and balance. So um, this is the table of the recommended amendments. In general, this take and bake soil is really good. I really, really like this. I, I think the pH is excellent. Um, the soluble salts are, are right at the target level. The chloride's low, the bicarbonate is low, um, the sulfur is sufficient. By the way, I'll stop right there and say, this is the saturated paste report. This looks at what's immediately available in the soil solution. Um, and this is the standard soil test is a strong acid extraction um, and, a, and a lighter ammonium acetate extraction that shows what's theoretically available in sort of the bank account of the soil. So, so one of the things that he mentioned there, I'd like to address because it's mentioned a lot. The soil test here on the left, that's basically the savings account of the soil. He mentioned the bank, what's in there for the long term. And he'll mention they used an acid to dissolve it. Tells you kind of forever what's in there because the acid's going to dissolve stuff that regular water wouldn't. Now, it may not be an acid, but biology is going to get in there and unlock some of this. In a highly biological soil, more of this will be released probably than anticipated fairly quickly. But if you have a perfectly balanced soil, immediately as soon as you take some from it and start growing the plant, it's now gonna be out of balance because you've taken some out of the account. It's less than when you started. So now the next part of the game becomes, do we add it during the season or between harvests so that we keep our bank account full? And the way I like to think of it is small containers and hydro has a bank account that is like direct deposit, but only has a dollar in it. You just gotta, every time you go, you gotta put some money in. You gotta feed every day because there's no holding power. In soil that has a huge checking account, to make a difference on it, you've gotta make a huge withdrawal or you've gotta make a huge addition to it. So when potting soil is done right, it both has a good savings account that will last as you start to take from it, but it also will start to turn into a good checking account where the balance stays for what's fluid and you can add back the things to keep it all balanced. What I mean by checking account is this pink one here, the saturated paste test, that was done using just regular water. And so it was not used in acid. So instead of pouring an acid and seeing how much calcium comes out, they literally pour water like you'd use in your garden and find out how much the plant would see with just the water being the solu uh, solvent, if that makes sense. So let's keep going. Magnesium is perfect. Um, potassium is good but I would recommend going a little higher. So I'm recommending applying a little bit of potassium silicate or potassium sulfate and applying a little bit for veg and then the second half um, fed through flour. So the balance is good here. I'm recommending just a little bit of gypsum to push the calcium up and quite a bit of potassium sulfate or silicate to push the potassium up. Um, from there, I go with the... One of the things that we do at build a soil is we don't use any potassium sulfate for the most part. Now it's in our build a bloom because we want balance against the phosphorus. And that's great because you can see that it might be needed later in flower. Coconut water has a lot of potassium, seaweed, there's a number of them. 
But what we do is when we do an initial soil test, typically the potassium is plenty from the compost. In fact, the original Coots recipes and some of them that are copious amounts of compost, you know, one third, they're excessive in potassium. So it's better to add that in flour, not up front. And if you think about what a lot of these people recommended, what did Coot recommend a lot of that wasn't part of the soil recipe besides this recipe? It was the Agsil 16H, potassium silicate. That was really to emulsify oil. But he would talk about kelp teas, all sorts of stuff that seemed to be potassium rich. Well, there's already excess in the compost. So when we get to balance, by the time you get to flour, adding potassium would make sense in those recipes, especially if you're only doing water only because things are in flux. So this, this, this makes a lot of sense. And uh, I know that initially when I first did the soil test, I looked back, potassium was fine. We've done a cycle, so it makes sense. And it makes sense that we did add a little bit in the last run and that it's still at a sufficiency level, but he wants to see more so that we get good yield. So I fully agree with that. We're gonna use potassium sulfate, like he said, but later in flour, I'm just gonna use build a bloom and I'm gonna use the coconut water. I'm not, I'm not gonna do anything except for this initial reamend. Let me get the rest of the video going and I'll try not to stop it again. Micronutrients. So um, I never see any copper or zinc solubility in the soil solution because they bind the organic complexes. So I look at those. All right, so just one more time. He said he never sees certain micronutrients being available in the saturated paste test because they bind with organic material. That's part of why we recommend adding big six every other week or so, just to make sure that you do have some micronutrients in there. There can be some compounds that are created. It's a little confusing. He's gonna look at the soil test to see what the acids pulled out to find like how many, how much total micronutrient was in there. Here's the challenge with that. Over here on the water soluble side, to get it to work, they use like a whole cup of your soil that they scoop and they put water on it. Over here, they take like a teaspoon. So what if your copper's one teaspoon over? <laughs> and so you have to take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. I will tell you though, that across thousands of tests, it seems like it's fairly accurate. So at least you can um, rest assured in that, so. Those on the standard tests, and I like to see copper between five and 10 parts per million. So I'm recommending a little copper sulfate and just a little bit of zinc sulfate as well. Um, the solubility of the, of the other three, boron, iron, and manganese is a little low. So I'm recommending all three of those, um, specifically iron. I would say that's one of the biggest priorities uh, on this entire test is iron. And then the final thing I want to chat with you about is, is nitrogen. So you can see there's a little bit of ammonium um, and quite a bit more nitrate. That's very normal. That means that this, this soil is ready to plant. So that's one thing I said, we don't add a lot of nitrogen to our soils, lots of compost but it's fully mellowed out and finished. And all of our soil testing is gonna show low ammonium and decent levels of nitrogen, but I never shoot high on that. Highly, highly, highly recommend using some amino acids or a liquid fish, and you're gonna get a big jump out of build a soil because now everything else is mineralized and composted and you're kind of pouring the lighter fluid on it when you use the nitrogen. I don't like to overdo it, but just tiny amounts of amino acids, you're gonna see some very sped up growth in our potting soil. And it makes sense, especially on round two, that we're gonna to wanna to keep that up. So let's keep going. Um, some organic nitrogen amendments. I'm recommending some plant-based nitrogen amendments, alfalfa meal and soybean meal to really push this nitrogen level up um, and get things moving in that regard. And again, I use the gnarly barley because he was just choosing, right? Once you know the science, you can pick and choose whatever you want to. I'm following the prescription, but instead of using the alfalfa soy, I use the gnarly barley. I think it's a little bit better. Regard. So. Just to take a look at the recommendations, I think nitrogen's the, the first priority, followed by potassium, iron, and copper. So I'm addressing those through these amendments as well as a little bit more phosphorus and some of those other micronutrients. Um, so it looks like a lot of different amendments, but really um, it's not a very heavy amendment because as I said, this is a really nice balanced soil, um, pushing all the levels up a little bit, but I'm, I'm I, the plants would do really well with a little bit of nitrogen just as this soil is. It's great. Basically what he said there is we could just run this take and bake round two with just a little bit of nitrogen and we'd be good to go. Of course, the build a soil away would put some craft blend, use the build a bloom, um, and you'd be hitting a lot of these metrics. So I hope that I've kind of driven that home. The build a soil away does work. It's based off of our testing and modeling so that you have good success with it. But if you're not using our soil or if you're just making something from scratch or if you're on a farm, soil testing will pinpoint it right away so you don't have to guess and then from there you can just keep it on an even keel hope this helps and let me know if you have any questions that's it
That was the whole video. He did a great job. The amendments were done the way I like using some organic nitrogen sources. He gives you a couple of different tips on applying nitrogen. And of course, if you get one of these, you'll have all your questions answered. So it won't really be a big deal, but it's time to get to it. I've added everything in here. All I want to do is kind of mix this together before I apply it. So I'm going to grab this. I'm going to grab this and we're ready to go into the 10 by 10 right now and do the re-amending. <laughs> Come on in. I wanna mix this together and show that to you, but let me show you the plants because I'm gonna get all dirty and sweaty mixing this stuff in and I'd rather talk about it right now. So the seeds, I haven't mentioned them. I've kind of done some behind the scenes stuff, but they all sprouted and thankfully because I put them in the soil, I put the dome on and you saw that and then I took off to go to Chicago and we did the Chicago Canicon. I met a lot of you, really blew me away. Drop a comment in here, it was great to see you guys. But I was hoping the seeds would pop and I got back. Of course, I had people here, so they took a picture and said that they had popped. One of them didn't, and that was the icicles. Uh, the other icicles did pop. And these were older seeds. They were given to me by Nick Risden by way of compound genetics. And so sometimes when they're older, I like to pre-soak them. Um, and I didn't pre-soak this time. I just put them straight into the soil and went for it. I kind of like just going straight in the soil though. Anytime you have the chance to it, it seems like they do really, really well that way. So I've got, I'm gonna keep one of each. Obviously that one is gonna be the one I keep of that. Out of these ones, I'm just going to, they're very uniform. So I'll probably just pick whatever one speaks to me on the day we're going to transplant. These aren't ready for transplant yet. I've got to set up that quadrant, which I'll do later. And I've got a little time there. I've got a, a week or two to do it before these get big enough where they're going to need new shoes. And I still haven't finalized exactly which drip setup I'm going to use because there's a thousand ways to do it and they'll all work just great for me. So I'll discuss that with you. Uh, the clones, look at them, jumping in size, really beautiful color on them. You can tell like when they were first cloned and cut, how they had a little bit of tip color from where I cut them and then a little bit of crinkliness and now all the new growth is looking beautiful. There's root tips coming out the bottom. They're a little bit light, which means they're drinking their water. Everything's ready. I've got one of each extra. These will be the new mom plants. And then I've got the ones that we need to transplant. These are ready. I'd like to transplant them. They're not fully engulfed in roots, so it's not too late. Uh, but if I don't do it soon, it's gonna be harder to keep these happy and I'm gonna to have to start feeding them. What I'd like to do is transplant next week. The only reason I'm really waiting is I wanna do the re-amend on the soil, which we're gonna do now. And because I'm adding a whole bunch of stuff in there and micronutrients, I don't wanna plant the same day. I'd like to give myself a buffer where the biology goes to work on all that stuff, the cover crop breaks down, the amendments start to break down, and next week I'll check in on Monday and I'll make a decision. Is Monday the day, is Tuesday the day, and next week we're gonna record the episode where we kinda of do day one starting veg where we've transplanted. I could have counted day one earlier, but a lot of you might be buying a clone or getting it from a buddy and day one's the day you plant. And because the seeds are on a different timeline, day one will be when these are transplanted. And we're just gonna call that day one when everything gets in its final home. And then we'll start putting on the videos which day we're at basically since transplant, if that makes sense. Earth box cover crop, looking really good. I sewed it on here. I did the same thing to the three by three. This is the build the soil way. If you do have downtime between rounds, I like to reinvigorate the soil with some roots by getting the cover crop in there. That starts feeding the soil. And then I can, when it's so young like this, it just turns into plant food, kind of like the alfalfa meal we discussed in the reamend. Instead, it's just fresh young cover crop. That'll all turn into fresh nutrients. For right now, it's not going crazy with growth. So I can kind of just kick that to the side and focus on what I really want to do. I could lift this light up, but I'm just gonna get in there and leave it. Then I have to readjust it back down. I'm trying to be more efficient with my light use. If I had this on the ceiling, I'd have that fully blasted and that's gonna produce more heat and it's summer out. So I don't wanna produce the excess heat. I'm gonna keep this low and keep the light closer. Season two, episode one, I pulled the stalks out of here. And I mentioned that you can leave a little bit of stalk and literally plant next to it, or you can rip the stalk out and a little bit of root ball to create enough room to plant wherever you want for the next time. So. I ripped out the root balls, I put the cover crop in, and I've moistened it so that the worms and the cover crop and everything's active and alive. And now it's time to do the re-amend. I've got the micronutrients here, which I'm gonna shake and make sure they stay in solution. Okay, that's already better mixed. You can see what it looks like, just a whole bunch of organic amendments. What I'll probably do is maybe do the PDF of the recommendation I got and our soil test and post them up so you can see like every detail on the soil test, exactly what we were looking at. It's organics, it doesn't have to be perfect, but I do want to apply it fairly evenly so they don't have any hot spots. And there is a little bit of iron sulfate in here and I want to evenly apply that. So now I can use a scooper, I can use my hand. Essentially, I just want to make sure there's no real hot spots here and I want to evenly spread this everywhere. 
So I'm just going to get in here with my hand and start to sprinkle it. Now, this cover crop, there's many ways. Some people get little shears and they literally cut it like a, with a mini hedge trimmer and drop it because they don't want to till at all. On the farm though, a lot of times what you're going to do is just, even in no-till, you're going to kind of crimp it, smash it, just lightly till it in in the top inch, not like we're digging six inches down, eight inches down. And so that's acceptable too. The other way would just be to do this, water it in and then smother it with a mulch layer or compost layer. A lot of times when I'm adding organic amendments, I also add lots of compost in here. What I'm most likely going to do today is just put this in, just work it in with the cover crop. And then I'm going to put mulch on later because the blue oyster straw log I like to use was back ordered. I don't have any in supply right now and they're coming very soon. And I'll probably put just a little bit of worm castings down. I may decide to do it right now. I'm not positive. This is a second cycle bed. So there's worms in it. There's castings there. I'm probably fine just doing this. But anytime I top dress, I oftentimes like to add more organic material like compost or castings. Okay, it's getting to the bottom of the bucket. So I'm just going to go around, make sure that I get it kind of everywhere evenly. The gnarly barley and the fish bone. That's most of the bulk. A little bit of cow post made up the rest of the bulk. Tiny bit of gypsum. So most of the stuff is very forgiving, even though it looks like a lot of stuff. And now, even though it wasn't perfectly even, I'm going to go and spread this around with my hands now and work in the cover crop. There's no real right or wrong way to do this. Some people are going to be very particular about tilling the soil even slightly, but I'm not as particular. And so what I like to do is just kind of start ripping and pulling it's a very young cover crop. So I'm not like ripping really deep roots out. That's going to cause a problem. And I'm just going about that deep just to kind of get everything worked in a little bit and get the cover crop broken down. And so that's going to create this cool texture on top, a nutrient layer. Remember the build a soil way, which I could mix this in. That'd be a recycled soil. We're doing no till, low till. And part of the reason why I want it all up here on top is once I plant the plants, they're going to get feeder roots up top. They're going to go down below for water and minerals. And I feel like it's going to create that balance where even though I put quite a bit in here, it's going to be very hard to overdo because it's all on top. It's not fully mixed into the soil. And we're going to add a little bit more later by adding those amino acids. So I don't have to hit the nitrogen perfect. We're going to add some coconut water. We're going to add the root wise. So I don't need to hit the potassium perfect. We're going to add the build a bloom. So I don't need to add it perfect. And in organics, less is more. You can always come back in, top dress a little bit later, add a little bit of water soluble organics. But if you overshoot it up front, you're setting yourself up for just a really slow go at it. Look at this, it's already kind of coming together. I'm barely really working the top of the soil. And this, now that it's kind of pulled up, will all start to die, this cover crop, and turn into plant food because it's so young. The carbon to nitrogen ratio is so tight It'll just break down quick. It's not woody, like high, high carbon. It's so easy to use. And that's pretty much it. I've got all the seed meal in there. The gypsum is in there. I want to water it in and I've got the micronutrients already in the can. And I've got the Q in there, which will help disperse the moisture. While I'm shaking this up, this is the micronutrients. I'll remind you, we're on episode three, season two, talking about the take and bake and re-amending it. If you haven't watched season one, check out episode three, season one. That's where we made the take and bake from scratch to begin with and how you would make it if you order the take and bake. It's got free shipping. All of the individual parts come to you and you make your own potting soil from scratch. And as you can see from our results and the soil testing, it's a phenomenal recipe, take and bake. If you'd like to make it, watch that video. It was one of our most popular videos of the first season, so I'd recommend it. And I mentioned in there, I mix soil, I'm passionate about it. When I make the soil from scratch and use it for myself, I'm prouder of it. I, it's mine, I own that soil and it does feel better when it's freshly made, not made, bagged and shipped. So although I believe in our soil, it's kind of like preparing you a fresh homemade meal versus me prepping something and you reheating it later. So I hope that makes sense. I love our soil, but get your two hands dirty. Make your own potting soil with the take and bake take advantage of the free shipping. And when you get to your round two, you can send off for a soil test to see if it matches ours. Or you could follow the build a soil way, or you could maybe copy what we're doing here today and I'll publish the results. So trying to be as transparent as we can be, do you, but if this is part of it, we've got it all documented and we're happy to share it. Here we go, I've got the shape in here. I've got the one gallon per minute nozzle on there and I'm gonna keep shaking a little bit the whole way so these micronutrients for sure stay in solution. 
and are evenly applied on here. I've got one gallon, so that means that I can kind of evenly do this all the way. And it'll take me quite a while to go through the gallon this way, so it's not like I'm risking putting it all in one fourth of the bed and running out. If you had a much larger setup, make sure you have enough water where you don't run out and all your micronutrients are only on half your soil. On large scale, if there's enough, you can pre-mix your micronutrients in your dries and broadcast it, but most people are either gonna drip it and do a lot less more often, or they're going to do like this and actually spray onto the field with a boom sprayer out of the tractor. We do add the big six humic acid and micronutrients to our 3.0 soil, but like you saw on the saturated paste test, even if you freshly add it, you may not see some in solution. That's why people do tissue testing. That's why people look at soil test and they look at the saturated paste test. When there's money on the line and you've got a lot going on, the data is very important because even if you're not gonna make any changes, sometimes the science can throw out a major wrench in your, in your plan, like if you're high sodium and you just didn't know it, or if chlorides were really bad, or bicarbonate in your water. All these things become important depending on your situation but if you're indoors, you've got clean water, you got to take and bake. You can pretty much just follow the build a soil away because there's not going to be a lot of curveball variables like I mentioned, like the chlorides, bicarbonates, sodium, any of those. Now, if you just go down to Home Depot and buy bag potting soil, or if you go to one of these other local companies that produce out here, you might actually get way too much sodium, way too much potassium and have an excess situation. And that's a little different than we don't have enough. When you don't have enough, you just add it. When you have excesses, like you bought a potting soil, and had excess sodium, excess potassium. Now you gotta leach it out or overshoot it on the others. It becomes a problem. So starting with balance, very, very important. Look at that, it's all moist. It's all foamed up, we got the cue in there. I put all the amendments in, all that powder I just put in, you can't see any of it, it's already worked into the soil. The worms are gonna come up and grab that and pull it down, eat it. The soil biology is gonna all break it down. And of course the plants are gonna dig in there and break it down. What I don't want to do is put it all in there and wait two years and then plant because a lot of it will have been used up by nature. I did this right before I amended because it's most likely to be there. It's Friday today. That gives me the whole weekend to let this kind of break down. I'll keep it moist and keep it going. On Monday, I'm hoping that we have the new blue oyster straw logs in and I'm going to break up a straw log on here. The last thing that I'll probably do is sprinkle just a little worm castings in here to help break that all down. But man, it's black up top. It's full of castings. It really looks like the worms and everything's been doing its job. So I'm not too particular about the worm castings. I'm probably just gonna put the mulch. That's gonna be the main thing I want you to take from this is that if the light's just blasting on here on the cover crop, the worms aren't gonna come up and break it all down. If I cover it with the mulch, it creates this dark layer where it stays moist and that's where everything breaks down. You also notice that I don't just make like a cake that makes a brick. Sometimes customers will say they use the craft blend and it makes their soil too hard and they can't water it in. You need to ruffle it in there. You need to scratch it into the soil so that it becomes part of the soil. If you just make a layer of mineral on top, it can turn into a brick and you can't water through it. Those are just things to consider. I hope I made this seem simple. It really, really is. All we did was take the soil test, which I showed you how to take in the first episode. I sent it to the lab. A week later, I got the results. Bryant had the results done the same day from Soil Doctor. And today we're able to apply the amendments, water in the micronutrients, and basically we're gonna let this sit for a couple days, plant into it, and this will be one of the best rounds we've ever had. Now it's on its no-till, and as things get evolved, they get better. I wanna encourage you, don't throw your soil away. Keep it. That second round, that third round, that 20th round, they get better over time instead of worse. Especially, especially, especially if you're following the less is more protocol, you're reading your plants or you're doing soil testing. If you're trying to keep your soil and you're just dumping tons of shit in there because you can't figure it out, it's so full of excesses, no wonder why people throw their soil away. In, in hydro, you hear people flushing. That's because excesses is also a problem in hydro. If you just keep putting nutrients in and excesses build up, you have to flush them out before you can feed properly. So instead of flushing, instead of having to throw soil away, follow the build a soil away. Less is more, or get a soil test and make sure you're doing things appropriately. I hope this has helped. If you've got questions, I'm sure there'll be a lot of them. I love soil testing. I've read all the books. I've done a lot of this on our own, but I think you can trust the soil doctor. Um, we're gonna display the results. If you get something that you have questions on, our whole crew here can help. Zach, he does soil tests here for Build-A-Soil and he helps on customer service. You can live chat us, email us, and like always, in these videos here on YouTube, put it right here in the comments and questions section. We'll do our best to address it. It may be that it's a frequently asked question, uh, question video that we do instead of trying to type it out. But either way, we're paying attention. We do want to answer every single question because 
our feeling is that if you have the question and we answer it, but if we're able to document it, maybe the hundred other people thought the same thing can benefit from it instead of just on the phone when you call in. So I hope that helps. Like, subscribe, share it with your friends, and I'll see you on the next episode.